The Memoirs of Queen Hortense. My life has been so varied, it has been so crowded with honors, so filled with misfortunes, that it has become the subject of public interest. Some people have praised me unduly, others blame me unjustly, few have really known me. This was on account of my social position, which limited the number of those who could come directly in contact with me. In view of all this, I feel I am entitled to demand a fair trial, without favor, but also without prejudice. All my actions, great and small, have been prompted by my feelings, by my heart. If the heart be pure, can one do wrong? My love for everything that is fine, that is worthwhile, has supported me in the midst of my defeats and misfortunes. This feeling has been my strength and my comfort at all times. The following pages are not intended for the crowd. They are addressed to a few sensitive and understanding souls. It is by these I wish my conduct to be judged. To them, I shall show myself in my true colors. I say to this little group of friends, this is my real life. Study me, pity me, love me, admire me. I feel the need of arousing these emotions. They will form the charm of my declining years. Thus, the only audience I seek is one composed of friends. My brother Eugène knows me too well to need any explanations of my actions. What thought has traversed my mind, which I have not shared with him? Our tender affection for one another has made me confide to him every one of my emotions. As for my children, it is not for me that they should learn the unhappiness their father caused me. I have suffered so much for their sake. I have cherished them so dearly that when they know the truth, they will only love me the more. As far as myself, while the writing of these memoirs may prove painful, since they will remind me that what should have been the happiest years of my life were full of sorrows and trials. At the same time, I shall find satisfaction recalling the little good I have been able to perform. My grandfather, the Marquis de Beauharnais, was governor general of the French colonies in the West Indies. While living at Martinique, he became intimate with the family of the Counts Tasher de la Pagerie, who were originally from near Blois in Turenne but who had settled in the West Indies and owned important estates there. The Marquis de Beauharnais married Mademoiselle de Chastier, a rich heiress owning considerable property on the island of Santo Domingo and had two sons by this marriage. My father, the younger of the two, was born at Martinique and while still very young, returned to France with my grandfather when the latter was recalled from his post. About the same time, one of the Tachers de la Pagerie married a Monsieur Renaudin and also settled in France. In order still further to cement the bonds of friendship uniting the two families, it was decided that my father should marry a member of the same family. When the ship bearing this request for the hand of the eldest daughter reached Martinique, the young lady was dying. Later, when the family in France had asked to have the second sister sent back to Europe for my father, the fact that she had gone into decline following her sister's death and was afflicted with an incurable illness caused the youngest girl to be selected in their place. Her father accompanied her back to France and she became the Vicomtesse de Beauharnais. The ceremony was performed in Paris. Thus, it was chance that directed my mother's fate. Eugène was born in 1781 and I in 1783. Although my mother's social position was brilliant, it was not enough so to make her forget her family ties and the country of her birth. Across the Atlantic still lived her mother, now advanced in years, whom she wished to see at least once more. Then to her wish to leave France may have been stimulated by a certain feeling of resentment toward my father, a resentment easy to understand, but difficult to overcome. The latter, handsome in person, highly cultured in mind, was greatly sought after by the most prominent people of both sexes at court and in society. My mother's oversensitive nature took offense at these, at this excessive popularity. Indeed, she became actually jealous and felt that distance and separation would prove her best remedies. My mother and I sailed alone. I was four years old at the time. We embarked at Avra. Hardly had we left the port when a violent squall threatened to capsize our vessel. On arriving in Martinique, we were received by my mother's family with transports of joy. We led a quiet life, visiting now at one plantation, now another. My mother enjoyed our stay and we returned to France only after three years. I can recall only one particular incident of our stay at Martinique, but this registered itself on my imagination vividly. I was five years old at the time and had never known what it was to shed a tear. 
Everybody had spoiled me and never had one of my wishes or impulses been thwarted or rebuked. One day, while living on my grandmother's plantation, I was playing beside a table in which she was counting money. Now and then, a coin fell to the floor, and I hastened to pick it up and give it back to her. I noticed she made a dozen or more piles of big copper pennies, which she placed on a chair when she left the room, taking the rest of the money with her. In some way I cannot describe, the idea came to me that these pennies were intended for me to do what I pleased with. I was absolutely convinced of the fact and gathered the separate piles into my skirt, which I tucked up so as to form a sort of pocket. Having done this, I set out with my treasure trove, perfectly free from any qualm of conscience. So firmly was I convinced that the money really belonged to me. Going to one of the mulatto house servants, I announced, John, look at all this money Granny gave me for the poor black people. Take me round to their cabin so I can give it to them. The heat was terrific, as the sun was still high, but so keen was my pleasure, I could not bear to wait. John and I discussed the best means of doing the greatest good to the greatest number of poor people. I went from cabin to cabin, my money still in my tucked up skirt, which I held firmly with one hand. Only taking out the sums John had decided I ought to give. My mother's old nurse received a double share. At length, all my money was gone. A crowd of grateful Negroes surrounded me, kissing my hands and feet, and I returned to the house triumphantly, filled with joy at having been the cause of so much happiness. On my arrival, I found everything in a state of commotion. My grandmother was looking everywhere for her money. The servants were terrified, as no one knew who might be accused. In a flash, I realized what I had done, overcome with despair, and obliged to admit my guilt. I confessed immediately to my grandmother, but what an agony that confession was. Reproaches were heaped upon me. I was made to feel I had been a liar and a thief. But it was simply my imagination that had led me astray. I had seen the copper set aside and heaped up into separate piles and concluded they must be intended for the poor. The money was left on a chair within my reach. Consequently, I was to take it and distribute it. Out of these fictions, I had made a reality. The humiliation I suffered as a result of this incident was so intense that it influenced my character permanently. Ever afterwards, I mistrusted my imagination, and I believe I can declare sincerely that, since that far-off day, I have never told a lie or even sought to embellish the truth to the slightest degree. News of the revolution caused disturbances in the colony. Monsieur de Vieux-Mesnel and Monsieur de Dama in turn became governors, but the latter was obliged to leave precipitately. We were living at Government House at the time. One night, my mother received word that the cannon at Fort Royal was to open fire on the town the following day. Immediately, she arranged to have us taken aboard a frigate whose captain she knew. As we crossed the fields, which are called savannas, a cannon ball fell close behind us. The next day, the town was seized by revolutionists, and the French ships were ordered to return to their anchorage under threat of being fired on by all the guns of the fort. The crew of our vessel announced their intention of returning to France. They carried out their threat and hoisted sail. But as we were leaving the harbor, the mutineers fired on us. Thanks to Providence, we escaped untouched. It was in this unexpected and sudden manner we left Martinique. We had not been able to say farewell to any of our dear ones. The frigate on which we found ourselves was called the Sensible. Toulon was her destination. The crossing was favorable as far as the Straits of Gibraltar, where our pilot made a mistake and steered too near the African coast. We touched bottom. A few instants later, the ship was aground. Sailors, passengers, and children all tugged at the ropes, and once more, we escaped in imminent danger. On her arrival at Toulon, early in November 1790, my mother learned for the first time of the events that were disrupting France. The revolution had broken out. My father had become a prominent figure of the political party whose doctrines he had espoused. His brother had joined an opposing group while my grandfather had retired to Fontainebleau, accompanied by his father. Who had joined an opposing group while my grandfather had retired to Fontainebleau, accompanied by his old friend, Madame Renaudin one of my mother's aunts, it was to Fontainebleau that she and I went to live. Eugène had been a boarder at the Collège de Arcourt. He left school and joined us. It was at this period that he and I developed that similarity in taste and feelings, which caused us always to agree in our amusements, our happiness, and our misfortune, and to react in the same way to any event affecting our common lot. No premonition warned us of the brilliant but checkered fate that lay before us. Indeed, my brother and I felt 
that considering our extreme youth, we had already had more than our share of adventures. We discussed at length the experiences through which we had passed. I described my trip to America, the revolt of the Negroes, our hasty departure, the danger we were in when cannonballs fell all around our frigate, and the almost equally great peril that threatened us when our ship almost sank off the African coast. Eugène had not been so far afield, nor did he foresee that in time fate would lead him, now through the sands of the desert, now through the icy wastes of Russia. He was still a mere schoolboy, living with a tutor at the Collège de Arcourt, and he admitted that I had known more thrilling adventures than any he had known. Yet he too had tales to tell. He described for an instance, with all the vivacity that accompanies our earliest memories, what had befallen him the day of the celebration in honor of the Federation. He and his tutor, the latter wearing the full dress of an abbé, had gone out early in the morning. They intended to visit the Champ de Mar, where the festivities were to take place. On the way, they found themselves surrounded by a crowd of enthusiastic working people bound for the same destination and transporting earth and other materials for the construction of the amphitheater, which is still in existence. My brother walked beside his tutor, holding the latter's hand. Suddenly, six fishwives, who were dragging a little cart, laid hold of the abbe, harnessed him between the shafts, climbed into the cart themselves, and began whipping him to make him haul them along. The aggressors paid no attention to the ecclesiastic's six-year-old companion. Eugène, however, furious at seeing his tutor thus assaulted, rushed to his defense. Seizing an umbrella, the only weapon within his reach, he ran after the cart, belaboring with all his might those who came in his way. At the same time, he demanded loudly the release of his tutor. His courageous attitude apparently attracted the attention of some personage possessing authority who released the victim from his ridiculous position without regard for the tumble, the sudden unhitching of their steed might cause the fishwives. Too young at the time to understand what was going on around us, I can only recall a few episodes of the days of the revolution. At the time of the flight of the king and his arrest at Varennes, my father was president of the constituent assembly. His firm attitude, the manner in which he maintained order in Paris aroused for a time great enthusiasm. Even in our retreat at Fontainebleau, whenever people caught sight of my brother and myself looking out of the window, there would be cries of, there are our Dauphin and Dauphine, our princess and prince. Whenever this occurred, we retired hastily, as incapable of understanding the cause of the demonstration as we were of surmising what the future held in store for us. At the close of the session, of the Constituent Assembly, my father left Paris to take over his post with the Army of the North, to which he had just been appointed with the title of General. He wished Eugène to return to school. My mother considered the time had come when my education should also be seriously commenced. Madame de Chabrian, abbess of the convent of the Abbé au Bois, was a relative of my family, and it was to her care I was confided. In order that she might see us both more frequently, my mother left Fontainebleau and settled in Paris. At the convent, I happened to be the youngest of the boarders. Consequently, everyone spoiled me. The abbess, the nuns, my fellow pupils, and in my new surroundings, I received the same tender, affectionate care to which my mother, who could not bear to see either of her children unhappy and who was constantly afraid of causing me the slightest sorrow, had accustomed me. Thus, my first contact with life encouraged my belief that everything and everybody was delightful. If some involuntary fault on my part provoked a frown or a word of reproof from those about me, I sought at once to adopt an attitude that would win their forgiveness. I promised to behave better and did my best to carry out my resolutions. A few months only had elapsed after my admission to the convent when my mother sent for me. It was the 10th of August, 1792. The mob was attacking the palace of the Tuileries. Paris was in an uproar on such day my mother felt she should be with her children shortly afterward the schools and convents were destroyed we continued to live with my mother until conditions became so unsettled in france that she decided it was safer for us abroad the prince of psalm who held the same political views as my father but did not inspire the same confidence because he was not french decided to emigrate to england his sister the princess of owen zollern was to accompany him and it was suggested we should be taken along as their children the moment my father heard we were leaving the country, he dispatched a messenger to the prince asking him to send us back to Paris. He did not wish for us to leave France. The message reached us at Saint-Paul in the province of Artois, where we happened to stop for a short time. Had it come two days later, 
we should have been on shipboard. The prince and princess brought us back to Paris themselves, and in spite of her anxiety for our safety, our mother was delighted to see us again. She was living in retirement at the time, not at all in touch with the people in power, and it was her kind of heart which caused her to emerge from her seclusion. She did so on behalf of Madame de Moulin, an old lady of 80 years. The latter called on my mother with the news of the arrest and imprisonment of her niece, a Mademoiselle de Bethesie. The niece was only 19, but in spite of her youth, the fact that she had entered France from abroad rendered her execution likely. If the case was ever brought to trial, with tears in her eyes, the poor old aunt besought my mother to save her niece from certain death. It was useless for my mother to reply. She could do nothing that she had no influence with and was quite unknown in official circles. Madame de Moulin assured her that a request made by the wife of a general in one of the French armies would meet with a favorable reception. It is always pleasant to feel we can be useful to another human being. My mother called on the various authorities, presented her petition, and secured the release of her protege. It was Tellier who was the most active in assisting my mother. This was the first occasion on which he won our gratitude, which was all the deeper because in those days to help the unfortunate was to risk one's own safety. In the midst of the upheaval that was taking place in Paris, parents did not find it easy to attend to their children's education or to select their teachers. It was my mother's companion, Mademoiselle de Lannoy, who acted as my governess. She belonged to a good family, was well-educated and considerably gifted along certain lines. Her lessons should have proved useful to me. Unfortunately, her attention was principally absorbed by political matters.